Hey everyone, this is a Barclay Damon Live broadcast of the CyberSip, practical talk about cybersecurity. I'm your host, Kevin Sapansky. Let's talk. Hey everyone, Sway Liu is an Empire Innovation Professor at the State University of New York at Buffalo, where he serves in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering. He is also the director of the UB Media Forensic Lab and the founding co-director of the Center for Information Integrity. And Professor Liu joins us now on CyberSip. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Come well, on. thank you for being here. I am a fan of your interviews and lectures on YouTube, and I commend you in the audience. If you have not seen them, tune in. There's some really great, concise, and easily understandable presentations on deepfakes, which we are not going to talk about today, but we will in an upcoming episode. So thanks, Professor. Thank you um, very much. So, with your permission, I'd like to talk about artificial intelligence or AI today. There is so much talk, sometimes frighteningly uh, mm -hmm. uh, concerning talk on social media and cable news about AI. So mm -hmm. I thought we'd start with the basics. I am I'm not an AI expert. I know there is natural or human intelligence on one hand and artificial or digital intelligence on the other. But let's start with the basic definition. What is AI? Okay, AI stands for artificial intelligence, as you know, um, and is basically, you know, uh, involves in designing algorithms and that, that drives computers can behave and, and, and do things the same way as a human will do. So uh, it's, it's a com computational simulation of human intelligence. So on that point then, um, Professor, I did want to ask you, how does it work at a, at a high level? We, we don't have an audience of, of mm -hmm. computer scientists, but can you just walk us through at a high level how AI functions? How, how do the algorithms facilitate sure. this artificial intelligence? Sure. Um, well, if we talk about AI, the, the history is actually quite long. Um, the first time this term AI showed up uh, um, in, in, to the public was actually in the early 1950s. Um, and AI has a long history and several generations of methodologies. So I'm talking about the most recent one, um, which is, you know, to be more specific, a lot of people heard of a name called machine learning. So it's essentially, you know, um, equipped a computer and an algorithm um, with abilities based on this idea of learning. So how do we, how do human learn some skills? You know, we, we do this by practice. Like people say, you know, the way you go to Carnegie Hall is practice, practice and practice, right? right? The same way is used for, for the, for the machine learning algorithms. So what are we trying to do? Just taking a simple example, let's say do image recognition. I want to recognize this is a picture of dog and this is a picture of cat. Now it used to be, you know, to make the computer do, uh, do this, we need to tell the computer, you know, cats is a furry, you know, with a taped ear and that kind of fuzzy face. Dogs have longer, you know, snouts and, you know, other features. These are not computer learning. These are human understanding and transfer that knowledge to computer. And that is actually, you know, at a certain point of time, that's all what AI does, but it's, it's less effective. And you know, we have to understand, we have to describe it in a way that computer can understand first. And that usually took a lot of time. Now, the, the new uh, scheme of this machine learning is instead of just doing that, it's just like we teach our babies to recognize what is a cat, what's a dog. We point to an animal and say, this is a cat. And, and, you know, she understands this is a cat. And then we point to another picture and say, this is a dog. And she understands this is dogs. So now she will figure out her, you know, the baby, her brain is very versatile. She will figure out what's the fundamental differences between a cat and dog. So in the future, when she sees something, she'll be able to make that connection and say, oh, this is a dog. Um, the same thing, uh, happens for the computer, for the machine learning algorithms. We show many, many number, uh, uh, many, many, uh, images of dogs and cats and we tell the computer we give the computer feedback this is a cat and this is dog every time the computer made a prediction we evaluate on that prediction say the computer see a picture say this is a cat we say no no no, this is wrong this is a dog so the computer will learn from the failures and build that knowledge internally 
around, um, over time. And eventually the computer can do a really good job. The algorithm can do a really good job of uh, differentiating images of cats right. and dogs. That's how essentially, you know, uh, the algorithms learn. But I imagine that unlike human beings, it may take months or years or longer to learn to make those distinctions. The algorithm teaches the computer to do it much more quickly, if not immediately, right? Absolutely, absolutely. This is um, um, uh, because we, we now, at, so one, one reason uh, I should add that we are seeing this boom of, of artificial intelligence and machine learning is because we have unprecedented computation powers. Um, right. So that's why, you know, even though the word artificial intelligence showed up in the 1950s, we didn't see a lot of applications for AI um, back then because, you know, the computers are simply not powerful. We do not have that much data and the computer cannot, you know, process that huge amount of data. Now right. we're reached that point and the computer can basically learn, you know, instead of actually we point a picture to a baby, and that takes some time, you know, even though this is to us, it's pretty quick, but the computers can read the image in a matter of milliseconds and then understand that. So just think about, you know, it, it condensed the whole learning process of usually will take, you know, at least, you know, I would say a couple of days working with a baby, the computer probably can do it in just a matter of a few words. So that's why the power is, um, is accelerated. The learning process is accelerated and, and, and that's where the power uh, of this algorithm lies. You know? yeah. Now, many of us may have learned about the potential for AI only in the last few months. I think it was November mm -hmm. 2022 mm -hmm. when we all learned about uh, chat GPT yeah. and the, the, uh, the LLM. Can you walk us through the, how the large language models work? How does AI work in that setting? Well, the large language model work almost in a similar way as the simple example I gave uh, for image classification. Um, what the, the, the AI, uh, the large language model uh, rely on is number one, a huge amount of data. So in the, in the case of ChatGPT, it basically produce um, all the online document, digitalized document, um, um, stopping at, I think, uh, later 2020. So that's a huge amount of data you can chew on. Number two, it used immense, um, computation power. So there are, you know, just gigantic computing, uh, computation servers. There are big computer, supercomputers, um, and running for, you know, months to actually chew on all those data. And what it does is actually figuring out um, a prediction job, simply as what I just described. You know, mm -hmm. um, I, I, I teach my daughter to recognize the images of cat and dogs. ChatGPT using similar ideas. So what it does is essentially predicting based on what I have. So you give ChatGPT, GPT, for instance, a sentence, but you don't give the whole sentence. You give the first word, and you ask ChatGPT to say, predict, give me the prediction of second word. And the, the model will say the second word should be like this. And then we'll give a few options and think one of them will be most likely. And then you, as the human operator, tell them. Now, we, we don't do this manually, but of course, we have the ground truth. We have all the text. We can tell them the correct answer for the next word is this. The machine will take that. If, it, 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 if his prediction is correct, it will, take, if it will learn that. If it's wrong, most likely it will learn from his failures, in, as in the previous case. So that's how it, it, it builds up its capacity slowly, but we're just talking about a massive scale of learning happening at the same time at the digital level, um, at, you know, at, at just as an amazing speed. And, and so, so that's, you know, it's, it, if we, if we take analogy of human learning process, that's basically almost exactly the same. We just, you know, uh, expanded that to a, a different magnitude. Yeah. Now you have been, I see from your, your CV, you have been a professor in this field for better part of two decades now. So you're an insider. Yeah. That being said, when you first saw this technology and how it works, how well it works, what did you think? Were you impressed by it? Is it I'm sure it takes a lot to impress someone on the inside who's, who is a, an yeah. expert in these areas, but what did you think when you saw it? Well, I, I think I have mixed the feelings um, to, 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 to that extent. Well, as someone uh, working in this area, you know, my, my work actually 
um, uh, covered a lot of this um, um, large scale models myself. Um, you know, one thing I, I feel happy about seeing the results because, you know, finally there is a model uh, that can do the job that we'll, most people will understand, you know, it's working well. Um, and we have been waiting for that time for a long, uh, you know, for, for quite a long period of time. Uh, when I started my uh, graduate study in artificial intelligence, in, you know, machine learning, that was about 20, uh, uh, more than 20 years ago, two decades ago. Um, back then, the algorithm is so limited, you know, we can only work on toy examples. And, uh, and in anything, we, if we want to work with real world examples, it's super hard. And that's why it's very, very difficult to convince people that these are things actually work. Now, right. ChatGPT changed the whole landscape and, and, and impression of that. So I think, you know, for this area, for this research field, it's certainly a great thing that is, you know, it helped us to improve our overall image. So that's one thing. I also feel like, you know, this is, uh, I kind of like, uh, not as surprised because I, I you know, it's, you, you probably heard about Moore's law for computation. There is a similar version of Moore's law for, I think, AI algorithm too, uh, that, you know, with the increase of computation power and the scale of computation, getting all the large data, I kind of already precede at a certain point of time, we're going to see something like ChatGPT uh, for text and, you know, mid journey for images um, and so on and what's that. And so I, I think, you know, it's, it's kind of like, it, I'm, I'm less surprised than I'll say, you know, uh, an, a, a typical user uh, first time e uh, interact with this. But on the other hand, I also have concerns now, you know, there is kind of like a, a phase shift, you know, from people completely, you know, overlook the development in AI. Now, suddenly people realize that AI can, can, can be so powerful um, and, and there'll be concerns there. So, you know, the concerns are not just, you know, starting from uh, uh, last year when ChatGPT showed up. It was, it was long running, you know, in the academic circle, people already talk about this, just like people don't pay, you know, other people do not pay a lot of attention. Think about this like a sci-fi uh, fiction, that, you know, we're not there yet. And this future just happened very quickly. So suddenly everything we talked about yesterday as a scientific, uh, science fiction, today it becomes reality. So those right. are the things I think I, even like a researcher myself working in this area, I start to ask a lot of questions because most of the time myself and, and my students are busy working on the technical details of artificial intelligence. And this social impact is a new phenomenon that we have to take, take it very seriously. So I think that's the kind of feeling I had um, at the time. So I know we're going to talk about this more in a separate episode, but since you raised it, I want to ask you about the, uh, the, the open letter published in the, by the Future of Life Institute. So a, a, a score or many scores of experts in the AI field publish a letter in which they note that AI systems with human competitive intelligence, mm -hmm. as they call it, can pose profound risks as shown by extensive research. And among those risks, at least discussed, are flooding our information channels with propaganda, uh, automating away jobs that are currently done by human beings, and even the risk that we might lose control of our civilization. Uh, now, again, I, I know we're going to talk more about this in a separate episode, but I read that letter and I followed some of the press coverage and I thought this talk of an existential threat seems fantastic. It just seems too, too bad to be true, <laughs> but is it? And, and how many years away do you think we are? Sui? are we, are we, are we at this point where AI poses an existential threat? Are we, are we 10 years away from that 50 years, a hundred years? What's the, what's the truth as, as you see it? Well, I appro I'm fully aware of the, the, the situation, the open letter you mentioned. I look at the situation a little bit differently. Um, I think, you know, whatever prediction I'm making now, say five years, 10 years down the road, whether AI is going to dominate the world, you know, take over the hum humanity, that was based on an assumption that we're not doing anything. You know, we just sit here and see the technology went by is following its own course. 
um, and doing that. Um, I'm a strong believer that human, I mean, AI is powerful, but human brain is even more powerful. You know, we, we as a human, as a species, we survive, you know, 40 million years, uh, you know, uh, uh, several yeah. million years of history, many, many disastrous, more disastrous situation happened and we're still here. And, and one thing I learned is, you know, human, humans are very versatile. We'll find a way to handle the problem. So, you know, on, on one side, talking about, you know, controlling, limiting the AI uh, technology, I feel like, you know, we're, even if we want to do that, it is probably infeasible and, and too late. Too late in the sense that the genie is out of the bottle. Right. Um, you know, it, it is, there's no way we can put it back. I mean, maybe we can control, say, the U.S. government and, you know, all the Western democratic uh, governments can refrain from, you know, using uh, 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 misuse or abuse of AI technology, but we have no control over of other, other, other people, right? So, I mean, you, you, only good people got limited in that sense. Right. The other thing is AI technology are not, you know, I do not treat AI as evil or good or evil because the technology itself is very neutral. You know, we shouldn't throw the bath paper, uh, bath water with the baby at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. AI can do a lot of useful things for us. Um, we may not notice AI already functioning, already helping us. Like every time you pick up a cell phone, you, right? Give us I mean, some examples of that. Yeah, I mean, you pick up yeah. a cell phone. I mean, this has become so, so easy for us. When we take a picture, why there's a little box showing up and, you know, telling you this is a human face and automatically focus your camera to that, to that person's face. That's AI algorithm working behind um, on the chip of your uh, of your of your cell phone um, and the camera helping you to uh, locate where the faces are um, and and also you know you pick up a phone this time you you, you know like um, you, you call your credit card company you call your bank you hear sometimes you know well you hear a lot of times the customer service phone calls are like you know almost like 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 real humans but they are not these are systems developed in the 1990s um, um, where, you know, automatically recognize your voice and then generate voices to respond to your questions. So AI system is already there helping us. It's just like, they're not like funfair, as much funfair as chat GPT, right? Right, um, right? And I think the third thing is instead of focusing our energy on limiting the AI technology and, 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 you know, putting emphasis on the potential danger, the risk it creates, I think it's probably more constructive to say, how do we, you know, um, uh, mitigate those potential risks? That's what I, you know, my, my early point that the prediction, whatever prediction we have here is based on the fact that we do nothing, but we have a lot of things, there are a lot of things we can do. For instance, you know, we can encourage the, uh, right now, you know, AI developing in the current way is because that's where, that's the, where we're the right. Office, right? But can we make a financial model to make the companies you know, aware of the social, uh, social impacts to make sure their algorithm not doing bad things. Almost like, I mean, I, every time I think about this problem, I'm thinking about accountability. I'm thinking about liability, right? Like a car manufacturer, they have to pass all those crash tests. Otherwise their cars will not be on the market. Can we do something like that? Because, you know, that, that way, if they do, do not pass this kind of test, they cannot make any profit. There's, their product will not be even on the market. Um, maybe we should Im implement some measures like that to, you know, um, uh, guide the, uh, the companies behind the AI tools to comply with these regulations and to, you know, um, um, uh, I would say limit the negative use of AI, but encourage the good use of them. I mean, there are so right. many good use of them, right? right. So I, that's the way I see it. I like the concept of it being a neutral technology too. So we're getting close to the end of our allotted time, but I want to ask two quick questions before we go. First one is from uh, my my friend in podcast land, Justin Daniels, who uh, hosts a podcast with his wife, Jody Daniels. She said privacy, he said security. And maybe she said security, he said privacy. Either way, they cover them both. But anyway, Justin Daniels was kind enough to send me in a question. And the question is, you know, we're talking about uh, chat GPT and mm -hmm. literally pulling in millions and millions of pieces of data, some of it personal data. How how can we create a large data set for AI? 
and at the same time be sensitive to protecting the privacy of individuals who may be supplying some of that data? I, I will say we don't know how to do that at this moment. Um, that, that is actually a very actively researched topic these days. Um, this, this, uh, this notion of privacy in big data sets are simply not, I, I wouldn't say non-exist, but not being you know, emphasized uh, when we build all the systems. Um, and, and, and I, th that, but that, that's a real concern. You know, we talk about chat GPT, chat GPT have some information. I mean, tax data is relatively easier. You can just write it, write taped off right. some, write it out, write out all some of the sensitive information. But if we talk about images, it's more concerning because, you know, somebody used my imagery to train a generative model without my consensus. And later on, they create images of me, of lookalikes of me. That is a concern. Um, and, and also, also we have, we've seen recent cases of artists whose, whose artwork were used in training of generative models. There'll be a huge argument about, you know, who's, what right belongs to, you know, the IP, whatever, the copyrights belong to whom, right? So this is a huge open research area. We don't have any good solutions at this moment. But I think, again, in the next couple of years, you know, there'll be some solutions coming out. I'm pretty confident about that. Right. Yeah. One other question before we go, uh, Sway, uh, and um, on that note, if you had to make a prediction, what is this landscape? What is the AI landscape going to look like over the next five years, 10 years or 50 years? What things should we be looking for? Are there going to be advances in, in uh, economies of scale performing jobs jobs currently done by human beings are going to be done by computers will we see medical advances what do we look for in that period of time well i think i, I make an analogy of the the wild wild west now for ai you know it's it's a huge open new territory new frontier everybody jumping in uh i think in the next few years at, at least initially we'll see an accelerated development of ai technology it become more powerful um, uh, you know, um, we're, we're, we're touching on many other aspects of our lives. Um, but th th this trend eventually will reach a saturation point because I also understand the current model, as powerful as they are, they're not, you know, you know, uh, infinite, infinitely powerful. So at a certain point in time, we'll see a saturation point. Um, and, and also, uh, we, as we, we have better understanding of the AI technology, there will be more effective uh, I'll say, um, um, guidelines and regulations there. Like, you know, the wise, the white, white, wise be, be slowly becomes into a law abiding uh, community, right? I think that's going to happen. Now, in terms of, you know, AI taking away uh, jobs, I think that's for sure. It, this is the same thing we have seen during the industry revolution, right? During the right. information revolution, we have the typewriters, right? I mean, uh, computers replace typists. I mean, we used to have people typing in all the documents by right. hand and that, that those jobs are completely eliminated by new technology. But that doesn't mean that the economy is gonna, gonna collapse. We, we humans just, as I said, very versatile. We'll find new opportunities and we make, we, we ride on the waves of new technology creating new opportunities, new jobs, um, and, and cope with the situation. And, and that's, that's where you, I see the most amazing part of human nature is being very creative, being original and finding ways, you know, uh, original, you know, initially, you know, unthought of. So, so I think that's where we're going to see more of this sparking moments of human genius than, you know, in the past. So I, I'm, I'm actually in that sense, I'm a, I'm more optimistic uh, about the future than pessimistic. Well, that's a great place to leave it, Sway. So we will leave it there. Um, okay. But I'd love you to come back sometime and talk about some of the risks associated with AI, including sure. deep fakes, which I know is one of your areas of specialty. Would you come back and talk to us about that sometime? Absolutely. I'm happy to. Yes. Thank you so much, Professor thank Sway you. Liu of the State University of New York at Buffalo. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, have a good day. And thanks to all of you for joining us. The CyberSip podcast is available on BarclayDamon.com, YouTube, LinkedIn, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Like, follow, share, and continue to listen.